welcome to a very special edition of Hannity. Now, tonight we take an in-depth look at the Middle East ticking time bomb, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and the imminent threat it poses to America and the rest of the world. Now, it's a story that Iran does not want you to hear. In fact, the Iranian regime is publicly condemning the new film that is already selling out screenings all across North America. Now, the controversial documentary that exposes the alarming truth about the Islamic Republic's nuclear program is called Iranium. It is now showing in select theaters all across the U.S. And joining me tonight is the film's producer, Raphael Shore, and Fox News Middle East expert uh, on terrorism and the author of The Coming Revolution, Struggle for Freedom in the Middle East, who is also featured in the film. Waleed Ferris is with us. Guys, good to see you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, how, I'm gonna show, we're going to show in-depth clips tonight, but how dangerous is an Iranian armed uh, Iran armed with nuclear weapons. How dangerous is this? Well, the planet will move into a different history because this will be the first time a regime that uh, accept and support suicide bombing, small size, will have a large size nuclear bomb. And the chanting in Iran since 1979 till now has been death to America. So that alone will tell you how dangerous the world will be. Well, I agree. Until now, Iran has used every means at their disposal to attack Iran. It's been their enemy. They've used terror, whatever vehicle they have, whatever method they've used. So if they have nuclear weapons, there's no reason to believe that they might not use it. All right, let's start tonight, and this is in the film, uh, a history of Iran's hatred towards the United States and towards the West in general. The threat America and the world face from Iran today can be traced back to 1978. At the time, Iran was ruled by the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, a longtime ally of the United States. Iran is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. The Shah was rapidly modernizing Iran, introducing secularism and capitalism to a traditional Muslim society. Within Iran, the Shah was viewed as an uncompromising dictator. Growing distaste quickly turned into public outrage. Rightists and leftists from all across Iranian society, including Marxists, communists, and religious elements, formed a popular revolution to overthrow the Shah. And one man emerged as the leader of the movement. In February 1979, the Shah left Iran, never to return. Two weeks later, Khomeini triumphantly arrived in Tehran as a hero. Khomeini, the Shah was gone, but the Western influence he promoted was still present across Iranian society. America would soon become Khomeini's next adversary. In their perception, the leading power of the world of the unbelievers is the United States, and the United States is therefore inevitably the main enemy. America is the great Satan because, from their point of view, it is the enemy of God. We are Satan whispering into the ears of the Muslims, trying to tempt them away from Islam. For years, during our school in Iran, our teachers and the government, they told us the Americans are devils, they will kill us. Every morning, they forced us to just chant death to America. <laughs> All right, we know what happened in, in November of that year, uh, and when four, we went 444 days with Americans held hostage. Here's what's fascinating to me. I went back and I looked at the time, and there were people in our own government saying that Gandhi, that comparing the Ayatollah to Gandhi, New York Times thought this was a very favorable development. Reminds me a lot of people and what they're saying today about Egypt. This is the perception of jihad is yoga. I mean, don't worry about it. Uh, it's basically when the academic elite in this country, those who advise government, say that there is no threat coming from Islamic fundamentalism. And we saw what happened 30 years ago when uh, the Islamist fundamentalist of Khomeini said, we are here just to get rid of the Shah. 
and then there will be democracy. Then they destroyed their allies and established the Islamic Republic. And we saw this too in Turkey a little bit. In 2002, it was going to, they ran on moderation, and then each year, you know, progressive year, they become more dictatorial, and this becomes more of a theocracy, correct? So this is, there's a very common thread here. There is. In the Middle East, it's unfortunately democracy. Liberal Western democracy is unfortunately not to be found. And there needs to be de developed these institutions of democracy. Democracy is not just about elections. And sometimes Westerners make the mistake to think if we just hold an election, the, sol the solution has been found. But unfortunately, they need <coughs> to learn about what democracy is. And if you have one election, it's very possible that radical Islamists will be elected, as we saw also in the Palestinian territories. Well, let's go to this concept. They think America is the great Satan, Israel the little Satan, and that anybody that doesn't believe in Islam is an enemy of God. Well, ideologically, all jihadists, uh, those the Khomeinists in Iran, but also Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, Taliban, everybody, the international jihadists believe that the world is like an apple divided in two. On the one hand, where the caliphate is, where the imamate is. On the other hand, everybody else, the infidels. So this is an ideological position. If we don't see a reform hitting the Muslim Brotherhood today, or the Iranians with regard to this, we are still in a confrontation with, with the jihadists. Well, the issue is that this is a religious war, and most Westerners fail to understand that that's what's at stake here. That although we look at it with Western eyes, what we have a difficult time understanding is people who are motivated by religious idealism, religious fanaticism. When, when people hear religious war, they think that, uh, wait a minute, are you talking about a war against Islam? Do you make a distinction between radical Islam and, and those that are just practicing a different faith? Yeah, I make a distinction of radical Islam versus Islam. I know it's a challenging question in and of itself, but I believe that it's not important because there is so many people who are radical, and the, there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, and even if a what, small what percentage... What percentage do you think is radicalized? It's hard to know. Perhaps Walid has a better sense of it. I'd say between 5 and 7 percent have been impacted by... All of them, Wahhabis, Khomeinis, but we're talking about dozens of millions of people. That's a huge pool. That's a pool that Al-Qaeda and the Iranians can recruit from for the next 20 years. Isn't there also an intimidation factor for those that consider themselves more moderate, a fear to speak out against the radicalized groups? Well, the battle inside the Muslim world is about that. It's about those who control the microphone, those who have the satellite TV, the petrodollars, those who control basically the classroom on the one hand. These are the regimes and these are the organizations and civil society who are trying to free themselves and when they do, do so, how are they treated? Oh, you are agent of the Israelis, agent of the Americans. All right, we've got to take a break. We're going to show a lot more of this movie and coming up what uh, Iranians in the free world did not understand about the Ayatollah Khomeini's threat until it was already too late. At the time of the revolution, most Iranians and Westerners alike didn't fully understand Khomeini's guiding principles and the vision he had in store for Iran and the world. Khomeini was seeking what he called an Islamic revolution to establish the, the, the rule of Iran and the world as a whole. So the states in the Muslim world, those that have written constitutions, say something about Islam being the religion of the state or the Sharia being a part of a system of law. In Iran it goes much beyond that. Nehzat baray Islam ne mitunat mahsur bashad dar ye keshwar ya ne mitunat mahsur bashad dar hatta keshwar hai islami. The revolution succeeded in bringing radical Islamic fundamentalism throughout the Muslim world. Since its inception, the Khomeinist regime of Iran was already building what became later its international alliance of the 21st century. By the mid-80s, Iran has already reached the eastern Mediterranean, Syria, Hezbollah. And as of the 90s, Hamas inside the Palestinian communities. Today, we look at eastern Arabia. We look at northern Yemen and southern Saudi Arabia. The Iranians have been accused of providing support for the Houthis and using them in a proxy war against Yemen's Sunni Muslim majority. The way events are moving in this country indicates to us that Iran wants to export the Shia ideology by force. We look even into Africa, West Africa. We look nowadays into Latin America from uh, Caracas, from Venezuela, all the way down to Argentina. Iran has made a conscious decision 
to infiltrate the Western Hemisphere in Latin America. It's pretty clear that they've also looked at other countries in Central and South America, trying to line up a group of like-minded people who have as a primary goal sticking it uh, in the United States eye and working against our interests wherever they are. Now, that was a look at the new film, Iranium, now showing in select theaters all across the country. It's an American-made documentary about the dangers of Iran's nuclear program and one supreme leader's shocking vision to make a Muslim state, not only of Iran, but of the entire world. And back with us now are the film's producer, Raphael Shor, and Fox News Middle East and terrorism expert, also featured in the film, Waleed Ferris is with us. All right, um, they want to infiltrate Latin America, Central America, South America, and they're making inroads in many cases, as we see. Um, and I asked you, I said, well, what percentage of the world do you think is radicalized in the Muslim world? And you, you wanted to say something else, and you said it during the break. You think it's much higher than people think. Well, I think it, it's all about how you define radical. I think when you define it, as how many people are ready to strap a suicide bomb on their on their belt and blow themselves up certainly the percentages are lower but when you talk about the education when you talk about the belief system of the people in many of these countries it's really shocking and for example in egypt where we believe now there's a pro-democracy movement it's not so simple that they're all revolting for the sake of democracy in fact they did a pew poll in june of two thousand and ten which showed that a huge majority had quite radical views. For example, they asked how many people would like to see reforms either for liberal democracy versus Islamic reforms. And about 67 percent said that they want to see Islamic reforms and only about 20 percent said they wanted to see liberal reforms. Well, these are the people in Egypt and 20 percent support Al-Qaeda in another poll. And the poll I think you're referring to also says 85 percent support the death penalty for apostates. Correct. Those that do not believe in it. This is in Egypt today. So this is why a lot of people are telling us, no, no, no. Just like they were telling us in 78 and 79, Iran is going to be fine. The Ayatollah is the new Gandhi. Do you see similarities here? They're saying, no, Egypt is going to be fine. But are you, do you suspect, as I do, the Muslim Brotherhood will take over? Well, unfortunately, today the only strong opposition force in Egypt is the Muslim Brotherhood. Organized, you're saying? Yes. And they have been building up their power base for a long time. And if Egypt, with these kind of views, 80% want to kill people yeah. who leave, leave uh, Islam, those kind of views means that if an election happens very soon, they will probably elect the Muslim Brotherhood. All right, let's go back to Iran here, and, and let's walk through what their stated goal is, as I'm listening to all of this here. They want Sharia, they want an Islamic caliphate, Sharia law to govern not just Iran, but the entire Middle East, the United States, and dominate the world. And they feel... Just as your film points out that during the Iraq-Iran war, that children were sent in before soldiers mm. to, see, to see if there were any mines planted, and children died. But that for them is martyrdom. That is the, the single best way you can die. Sean, if you want to summarize what the Iranian leadership wants since 1979, it's very simple. They want to bring down 21 Arab governments as we know them, all of them. 50 Muslim states around the world on three, four continents, and instead establish an Iranian model caliphate, that they would call it imamate, but it won't stop there. First of all, they will reduce the rights of minorities, they will reduce the rights of women, they won't give enough rights to the youth, that's why we see demonstrations in Iran, and after that they're going to penetrate Africa. They are already in Africa, in Eritrea, in Sudan, in West Africa, and through Hezbollah to Latin America, to Venezuela, and ultimately, yes, act like the Soviet Union against us, against our homeland security. So this is as big a threat as, the, as communism and the spread of communism and worldwide domination that was a stated goal of the communists. With one little difference, Sean, is that the Soviets basically were deterred by mutual assured destruction ideologically because they like this life, they're atheists, they're not going to go to the other life. These guys are jihadists. Real life begins afterwards. So they won't be deterred by our nukes. That's why it's crucial that they won't obtain the nuclear weapon. So mutually assured destruction does work for them. It's not going to work. Because they're going to get virgins in heaven if they kill the West. In a, in a sense. We'll, we'll talk more about the rights of women, what it's like for them to live under Sharia, especially in Iran when we get back. And also coming up, utilizing terrorism as a tool to carry out Iran's radical Islamic objective. Over 30 years, the regime has used international terror in its struggle to spread Khomeini's revolution. When you look at Iranian government terrorism, what you understand is that from the very beginning of this regime, in January of 1979, 
they considered terrorism as a tool of policy. Not only does the Constitution say its mission is jihad, it quotes the Quran in verse 860, which says, uh, strike terror into the hearts of the enemy. Iran set up Hezbollah early on to have a cutout, somebody who could uh, independently carry out terrorist attacks with, quote, no fingerprints back to Tehran. Founded in the early 80s in Lebanon under the guidance of Ayatollah Khomeini, Hezbollah wasted little time before striking American installations. The day after this attack on the embassy here in Beirut, the death toll has continued to climb. It is believed that before the counting is over, more than 60 people will be found to have died, at least 16 of them Americans. Hezbollah's next attack would prove even more deadly, attacking multinational peacekeeping forces stationed in Beirut following Lebanon's civil war. At that point, this had been the largest non-nuclear explosion ever recorded. We worked for four days trying to find people who were buried, and then we continued to work just to find pieces of bodies, to put them together, every piece of a body we wanted to bury, and not just leave the bodies under the rubble. Their intention in attacking us in Beirut was to drive the United States out of Lebanon and ultimately out of the Middle East. Despite repeated proclamations that terrorists won't affect U.S. foreign policy, Muslim forces in Lebanon achieve their goal when Reagan withdraws all 1,400 Marines to the safety of offshore ships. When we pulled our troops out, we essentially sent a message to the Iranians, you win. We will respond to terrorism by retreating. It was a terrible message to send, and we've been paying the price for that ever since. And that was more from the dynamic new documentary called Iranium. The producer, Raphael Shore, continues to join me, as well as Fox News, Middle East, and terrorism expert Walid Ferris is with us, and who's also featured in the film. The story exposes the dark details of Iran's history with Hezbollah and how the Islamic Republic has provided both financial and material means to attack Western targets all over the world through acts of religious terrorism. Um, I, I might have one small disagreement on this and, and certainly what happened in Lebanon, but before I get to that, Hezbollah is a surrogate group funded to commit acts of terror by, directly by Iran. It's, that's what it was founded for. I was in Lebanon when that happened. I, I saw basically how Hezbollah was formed by the Iranian Revolutionary Islamic Guards. They first started in the Bekaa Valley, they moved to the south, then to Beirut. I was there when the explosions occurred, it woke me up in the morning, and that was the beginning of the campaign of Hezbollah on behalf of Iran, against the multinational force, then against Israel, then against the Lebanese themselves, and from there on throughout the world. The Iranian regime thrives on hiding behind other proxy parties. In general, they want to show one face to the West and not let people understand what is going on in their minds and in their ideology. I think that's probably why they've been speaking out against this film, Uranium, as well, because we set the record straight. We show in their own words, their own ideology, and people in Iran do not like this to be seen. All right, so they basically commit acts of terror by funding these outside groups. They have plausible deniability on their part, and they say, oh, we had nothing to do with this, when in fact we all know that none of that is true. All right, here's, through the prism of history, I guess we could all analyze Reagan's move to pull out the troops at, at the time. But he also had many other challenges that he was dealing with, you know, an economy that he was trying to rebuild and a, an evil empire and Soviet expansionism. And, you know, how many battles on how many fronts can we fight? Well, I think he was badly advised. That's my opinion, because I was on, on this other side and then on this side in the archives. And I saw what has happened. Basically, it would have taken President Reagan to call on a larger force. Hezbollah was very small at the time. And that larger force would have been supported by the Lebanese army. And Lebanon would have been extracted from Iranian and Syrian influence long, long time ago. The price of not doing this, basically, is Hezbollah taking over Lebanon, pushing everything to the south and flaring two wars with Israel, Syria having the long-range missiles, and giving Iran, uh, Iran all that time to have their missiles and possibly the bomb. 
I think that we shouldn't pick only on President Reagan because what we show in this film is that it's been a succession of presidents since the revolution in Iran in 1979 of misreading the regime. That's one of the main points that we show in this film, that American presidents have not understood the nature of what's going on in these countries. Isn't it, isn't it a little even deeper than that? In the 9-11 Commission report, used very profound words. I didn't agree with everything in the report, but they were at war with us. We weren't at war with them. They've been at war with the West for a long time. You know, but even going back to the beginning of this regime, when they held Americans hostage for 444 days, they were declaring war against the West. And, you know, pretty brazen act, but I think they feared Reagan when he came in. Otherwise, I don't think they would have released the hostages the day he was inaugurated. Well, I think the 9-11 Commission was right in one thing, that uh, the jihadists in general terms, including the Iranians, have been waging this war, not just a war of terrorism, a war of ideas. And one of the major achievements they have been able to do is to, de to deny the American public the understanding that we were at war. How can we be confronting them if we didn't know that they were ac actually against us? And that was the drama of 9-11 in my sense. All right, we're going to take a break, and we'll talk. Uh, I wanted to get to you guys about how women are treated under Sharia. We'll hit that. And also coming up, we're going to analyze uh, Ahmadinejad's radical rhetoric and what it could mean for America's future. That much more straight ahead. Ahmadinejad narrative is very strange for all of us. Um, he seems from another planet. Uh, he talks about a world without America. Imam Aziz, farmudi, chabayat, mustachbirin jahan, monhadem shavant. زنگ شمارش معکوس از محلال قدرت اهریمنی آمریکا به صدا در آمده است In 1998 the Iranians carried out a test to launch a Scud missile from a barge in the Caspian Sea. Many people believe that uh, this is what the Iranians would like to do with the United States, put a missile in a cargo ship going off of our coast and uh, attack Baltimore, attack New York, attack Washington, D.C. From 100 miles off our coast, would never see it. Another scenario uh, it clearly is to bring a small, man-portable nuclear weapon, a backpack nuclear weapon, across the Mexican border, which is, most Americans understand, is not very well protected. Hezbollah has been uh, making uh, linkages with Mexican drug cartels, not to compete with them in narcotics trade, but rather to use their already established channels of entry into the United States, up from Mexico, through the United States, and all the way on up even into Canada. When Mahmoud Ahmadinejad talks about a world without America not only being desirable, but achievable, he could mean probably one thing, and that is what's known as a strategic electromagnetic pulse. Attack. An electromagnetic pulse weapon is essentially a nuclear weapon that is exploded in the atmosphere up above. It doesn't hit the ground, it's exploded up in the air. It sends out pulse waves, shock waves. You have to understand what this pulse is. It's tremendously high energy. Every wire will pick up this pulse, take the energy, and burn out whatever is at the end. An EMP weapon, meaning a small nuclear bomb, detonated above the center of the United States would literally take down the entire power grid of this country. Not only would the power grid be out, it would be out for probably months, but every piece of electronics that we use, from pacemakers to phones to cars to gasoline pumps to water pumps, would all be fried. The Blue Ribbon Commission, established by the Congress, concluded this was an eminently achievable way of affecting catastrophic effects on the United States, specifically devastating the electrical grid of this country, and with it all of the infrastructures that depend upon it food, water, sewage, medical, commercial, financial, transportation. According to the chairman of this Blue Ribbon Commission, within a year, nine out of ten Americans would be dead as a result of exposure, starvation, disease. This country would cease to exist as we know it. And I'm back with Waleed Ferris, Fox News, Middle East and terrorism expert and the producer of Iranium, the film we have been discussing tonight, Raphael Shore. All right, let's start with this electro electromagnetic pulse attack. And what you're saying here in this film, it would take down the entire power grid of this country and literally probably for months, it would take, it would basically put America into what position? 
Well, the Iranian regime has always said, and Ahmadinejad in particular, that we can live without America. A world can live without America. This is a different attitude than Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda would acquire targets and try to hit them regardless. The Iranian regime is preparing itself for a strategic engagement with the United States when it can. And the EMP, basically, that Rafael could talk about, will take out our capacity, not just of responding, but right. of acting as a nation. All right, so they could have a test launch, as you say, off the coast of Baltimore or D.C. or New York, 100 miles out. There's nothing we could do to stop that? It's very difficult. As we show in the film, the, America is very porous. <laughs> if Iran has nuclear weapons, the possibilities are enormous. EMP is one of them. But if they could pass on a nuclear bomb to terrorist organizations, they could give it to people who are infiltrating from the Mexican border. There's any number of possibilities. How would they get that electromagnetic pulse to go over the center of the United States. How would they do that? That would need to be perhaps shot from a barge and that would be exploded over the United States. They have a Gulf or there are a lot of angles. I mean, let's keep in mind uh, that the Iranian regime and the Venezuelan regime have signed a strategic yeah. treaty. Now between Venezuela and the United States is the same distance that these missiles now are being tested in Iran from one point to the other. The same distance. All right. So we often hear Ahmadinejad talk about wiping Israel off the map. You know, we know, Bibi Netanyahu always said they view Israel, which they want to destroy first, as the great Satan. They view the, uh, I'm sorry, as the little Satan. Little Satan. And the United States is the big sta Satan. So his real goal is to get rid of America. Wouldn't he first try and take out Israel, though? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there's, there's no question when hate is so severe, so intense. They have two enemies that are very, inten very strong. It's not just... Israel and America as well. It's also Europe. It's the entire Christian world. It's the, it's the Western world. Yeah. The next logical question, how close are they to the scenarios that you're describing in this movie? How close are they to be a, being able to accomplish this goal knowing that, you know what, they think this is of the highest order, this is their mission, this is what they want. How close are they to actually achieving this? Sean, there are two theories in town here in Washington. One is that we are focusing on the nuclear bomb. How close are they? I have a different theory. They are really working on the delivery system. They are working on establishing the missiles because if they have launching pads out of Iran, potentially out of Hezbollah in Lebanon, possibly with Syria, now they are having facilities in Eritrea and the Red Sea. And as I said earlier, in Venezuela, once they would reach the number of missiles that they need for a first strike, if that is the case, then they'll bring their nukes. And at the same time, we won't be able to take out all these ramps. And this lunatic, and, and by the way, uh, for people that deny such evil could happen, are we denying the last hundred years of human history and, and communism and fascism and totalitarianism and Nazism and the killing fields in Cambodia leading up to later in the next century, 9-11? and the attack on the Trade Center and the Pentagon. I think human capacity to try to ignore evil is incredible. It, it is astonishing. And I think that's what makes this film so un unbelievable, because why don't people know about it? Why is this not reported? It's not like Ahmadinejad doesn't talk about it. It's not like it's not written in the Constitution of Iran that they want to take over the rest of the world with their Islamic regime. So it's not a hidden issue at all. All right. Uh, all right. When we come back, uh, why, when dealing with a country like Iran or Ahmadinejad, negotiations will never work? That and much more. Clinton, through Bush and now Obama, have all believed that there was some level of benefits that Iran could be offered that would get it to give up its nuclear uh, program. I don't think that one can proceed with this regime by negotiation. They regard this attempt or desire to negotiate as a sign of fear and weakness. Americans and Europeans are really uncomfortable with the idea of holy wars and mass murder for religious reasons. They can't imagine themselves slaughtering other human beings because the true religion needs to defeat the enemies of God. Because they can't imagine that for themselves, they also can't imagine that others behave that way. But this is a failure of imagination. این نهزت باید زنده بماند و زنده ماندنش به این خون ریزه هاست بریزید خونها را If you have those profound strongly held religious beliefs uh, you send people to the deaths you're, you're doing them a favor you're giving them a quick free pass to heaven and all its delights and we saw that during the Iraq-Iran war when they were willing to send hundreds of children to walk into the minefields to clear them. Until the time in our hands, in our 
در منطق ما شهادت در همین سطح از اعتبار نخواهد توانست بر جمهوری اسلامی و ملت ایران فائق بیاد و کدوم هنرمندی و هنرنمایی زیباتر و الهیتر و ماندگارتر از هنر شهادت Anybody who tells you that we shouldn't take this seriously is not looking at the individuals who are in power, who are ruling Iran today. They believe that by creating apocalyptic conditions that they will bring the Mahdi back. What makes that particularly alarming is the whole question of nuclear weapons. During the Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. But they didn't use them, and then they knew that they wouldn't use them because of what we used to call at that time MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. Each side knew that if they used nuclear weapons, the others would respond in kind, and this would obliterate everybody. With these people, with their apocalyptic mindset, Mutual Assured Destruction is not a deterrent, it's an inducement. And back with us is the producer of Iranian, Raphael Shore, and Fox News Middle East and terrorism expert, Waleed Ferris, is with us. We look at what the Ayatollah is saying here, that this movement has to stay alive, and staying alive is dependent on martyrs. Come and, come and bleed for us. Adolf Hitler telegraphed all of his intentions. Ahmadinejad wanting to wipe Israel and the United States off the map. He's telegraphing his intentions. Why don't people want to believe it? Well, uh, you're right, absolutely. The Iranian regime can be compared absolutely to Hitler in the 30s and the 40s or to Mussolini. Uh, they are connected to an ideology that they have promised their constituents that they're going to implement. I mean, Hitler wanted to create the greater Germany and the greater Italy, and here we have the greater caliphate or emimate. If they stop doing so, if they engage in moderation or in diplomacy, then they will lose. So they are condemned either to grow or to go. We saw another clip in that last segment. It said, you know, which art is more beautiful, more divine, more everlasting than the art of martyrdom? You would think after what happened on 9-11 and all that we've learned about radical Islam, the desire for an Islamic caliphate, Sharia law, that people would understand this is a real, clear, and present danger. I think that apathy is the, is the greatest danger that we face. And I think that perhaps the best way that's been expressed is that the Middle East is not the Middle West. And people have a great difficulty in understanding a different perspective, a different way of looking at the world. And if one looks at the, the world from an Isl the radical Islamic perspective, they're in a 1,500-year war. Yeah. It has ups and downs, but they look at it, they are on the ascendancy right now. They drove out the Russians from Afghanistan, they drove out Israel from Gaza and from Lebanon. Mm -hmm. America is soon leaving Iraq. They look at 9-11. These are all victories. Why, why wouldn't people even look at uh, life for women under Sharia? You know, with, uh, under the Taliban in Afghanistan, women couldn't go to school. They couldn't work. A woman uh, can't drive in Saudi Arabia. Uh, if she's seen in public, you know, you've got this whole, you know, uh, morality police. Right. How, if you yeah. can't be seen in public with somebody that's, that you're not related to, if you accuse somebody of rape, you need four male eyewitnesses to prove it. Mm. You know, I, they're stoned to death after being buried up, to, you know, halfway to their body. Why can't people see that and understand just how barbaric radical Islamic theocracies are? I mean, on the issue of women, we're dealing with apartheid, uh, gender apartheid. I mean, that should have been the clearest point, at least to our women's and, you know, feminist movement and, you know, the progressive community should have seen this first. I mean, in Iran, women... Progressives are, are, are totally silent. But, but, but this is a scandal because they should be the first one to defend, as they say, the rights of women. And in the Arab and Muslim world, when the jihadist regimes are perpetrating genocide against women, against their rights, I am very surprised to see that this community is not reacting. I think that the problem here is not just in, in, in the media, it's in the academia. Our students in the classroom are not served the truth. Our Middle Eastern studies communities, international relations, Islamic studies... Is it because they're not... afraid to be called Islamophobic? Well, they're, they're afraid to be referred to as bigoted. But somebody is referring to them. Who is that somebody? There is a core in our academic elite which has been funded for the last 30 years by petrodollars hundreds of millions of dollars have been inserted in our campuses and of course the donors are not going to want our students to know the truth all right we're going to come uh, back and we'll continue is there any deterring iran's regime action non-action what could either uh, option cost america that much more straight ahead
I think it's important that Iran understand that U.S. military action is a very real option if we feel threatened. I think that's a very unattractive option, uh, but I think it's even more unattractive to contemplate uh, Iran with nuclear weapons. If all other options have in fact been exhausted, I think that the question is not simply what are the risks associated with acting militarily, but what are the risks associated with not acting. The Iranian people with such a proud and ancient history were hijacked by a bunch of extremists. The fact that the United States keeps giving in to Ahmadinejad is a signal to the Iranian people that the American policy is to support Ahmadinejad. It's not productive given the history of U.S. Iranian relations to be seen as meddling, the U.S. president meddling in uh, Iranian elections. Well, the question is, should we have meddled in helping the dissidents of the Soviet Union? What is U.S. policy across the world? It's basically to always stand by the underdogs. At least make a stand, say a word. And we should be supporting the anti-regime elements those who are fighting for their freedom, those who have been dissidents, those who are marching in the streets, yelling, Obama, are you with us or against us? It's very much in the interests of the people of Iran, as well as all of Iran's neighbors and us, for us to do everything humanly possible to get this regime to collapse uh, before it gets a nuclear weapon. It is in the interests of the international community and of the United States to lend all the support possible the democratic movement inside Iran so that this regime will be changed as soon as possible. This is a question. Democracy inside Iran is a question now of international security. We have allowed them to believe that they can literally get away with murder. And now they are going to have the weapons of mass murder at their disposal. We should take this very seriously. We have to succeed. You know that, that old uh, tired adage, failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. In Rus سراسر ایران اسلامی از یک فریاد است و اون مرگ بر امریکا In the end, if the international community, if the United States will not form this resistance against the Iranian Khomeini's expansion, it will be too late. We will have to pay a much higher price. I'm talking about the entire humanity paying a much higher price to stop the threat. Now, failure is not an option when it comes to dealing with the nuclear threat of Iran. That is the main message of the new documentary, Iranium. And continuing to join me now is the film's producer, Raphael Shore, and Fox News Middle East and terrorism expert, Walid Ferris, is with us. You know, it, what you're saying here is we're going to have to pay a higher price. Um, you know, I listened to this president. He said he supports a nuclear Iran. This president, during the campaign, said he would sit and negotiate with Iran without precondition. But yet, since he's been president, they keep talking about death to America, defying the world in terms of pursuing their nuclear capability. Historians after World War II have always said and continue to say that we should have stopped Hitler before. That was the price for humanity to pay. Millions of people killed and dead. What I'm talking about here is that if we don't stop the Iranian regime from obtaining this doomsday device, from penetrating Africa all the way to Latin America, it's not just an issue in the Middle East. We may pay the price here at home. So it's an issue of national security. So when 1.5 million people in Iran would demonstrate in the June of 2009, 2009. we can't say we can't meddle. Obama, this is democracy. Obama this is democracy. Obama said nothing. They were calling out for support, just moral support. They got nothing. Yes, I think it was, it was a terrible mistake not to support the people of Iran. I do believe that a, the great majority of Iranians want to return to the civilization and be part of the family of nations. I think we have another opportunity right now, and I do hope the administration has learned its lesson and will support them. I don't think so. I, I, I don't see it happening. So, that, all right, the question is, Bush referred to this axis of evil. You know, Reagan talked about the evil empire. They had a much different perspective than Barack Obama. He seems to think we can get along and through outreach and being nice. What is this going to take? Does Israel and the United States, if this Iranian threat is as real as we've talked about tonight, do we have to strike first and take out their facilities? What makes me very concerned is the policy that I see developing since the last two years is to find the moderate wing of Hezbollah, 
to find a moderate wing of the Taliban, to maybe engage Hamas, to engage the Iranians while the Iranians are arming themselves. Do we have to take their facilities out? Is that the only way to stop them? I think we've seen from recent events in Egypt and what's starting to happen now in Iran is that there is another way. Military option has to be considered. There's no question. But we see that revolution is possible. We see that regime change is possible. The so people can so rise fund, up. The, fund the, the democracy movement within and try and bring them down from within first. If that fails, you have no choice. You've got to strike. It certainly Pretty has fair. to be taken very it seriously. Is it is fair. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. The question is, will the United States stand with Israel? Because I think Israel is the first target and the United States the second one. And the West, the entire West. Guys, uh, phenomenal film. Really, thank you very much for a very provocative hour. Appreciate you being with us. Thank, thank you, you for much. having us. Now, for more information on this must-see documentary, well, including where you can catch the film in your area, how to purchase a DVD, and how you can take action, you can visit their website, www.uraniumthemovie.com. And that is all the time we have left this evening. As always, thank you for being with us. Have a great night.